open your Bibles. I don't got anything else to say. <laughs> open your Bibles. Turn them to Genesis chapter 22, one of the, um, I, I think, one of the most powerful chapters in the life of Abraham, if not the most powerful. We're going to do the entire chapter, Genesis 22, title of the message this morning, The Ultimate Test. The Ultimate Test. So let's review. Abraham's life of faith started, was launched when God called him to leave Ur of the Chaldeans where he lived and go to some place that God would show him at some point. And God promised to make a great nation out of him. And God promised that all the nations on earth would be blessed through him. And when Abraham finally got to Canaan, it took him some time, uh, but when he finally got to Canaan, God showed him the land, took him to a high point in the land, showed him the land, and promised to Abraham that this land would belong to his offspring, to his descendants. And God promised Abraham that his offspring would number as the stars in the heaven, heavens and would number as the sand on the sea. He promised Abraham over and over and over. And in Genesis 15, 6, is our first real scripture about salvation by faith alone because in Genesis 15, 6, it says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So that salvation by faith alone thing isn't a New Testament thing. So, so that's Genesis 15. And then after that, God performs this one-sided, unilateral, unconditional covenant with Abraham while Abraham was put into that uh, deep sleep in chapter 15. Promise after promise after promise. And then there was the Ishmael fiasco where Abraham decides to take God's plan into his own hands. And so God in Genesis 17 convinced, not convinced, but, <laughs> well, he did. He convinced Abraham that the son of promise, that, that all of God's promises would come through, would come from he and Sarah, his wife. It's like he said, hey, I forgot to mention that I meant with your wife, you're gonna, <laughs> you know. So, 25 years later, after that promise, Isaac is born. Isaac is born last week. Husto did the message, did a great job. So 25 years, not after that promise uh, from the Ishmael incident, but 25 years in the promised land. And finally, uh, Isaac is born. Uh, but it's been a shaky 25 years, hasn't it? Some of us could say the same thing. It's been a shaky 25 years or 40, 40, whatever for me, 40. April will be 44 years for me. And uh, for Abraham, there's been some faith peaks and there's been plenty of faith valleys. Maybe you would say the same thing. But now that Isaac is born, Abraham really, really believes God. It's like, okay, God, you brought it to pass and you brought it miraculously. Abraham believes more than ever and that's precise, precisely when God's gonna put him to the ultimate test. When Abraham really sees like this proof of God's promise in uh, Isaac being born, God is gonna bring Abraham to the ultimate test of faith. And we kind of see, and maybe Abraham does in hindsight, but we kind of see that everything in Abraham's life is leading up to this point. Like this is the moment, this is the, the pinnacle, this is, this is the ultimate test that not just proves Abraham's faith as in a, as in a pass fail, but proves it, like, like steals it, like just it's from this point on, Abraham is the father of the faith. Let's pray, we'll look at it. Lord Jesus, would you bring your word to life to us, Lord? Lord, we see you and we see the cross here, God, and we also see this ultimate test of Abraham's faith. 
And we pray that we would put ourselves in Abraham's shoes today and that we would understand that you bring us to a point where we are at the ultimate test of our own faith. Show us that, make it come alive to us by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In your name, Jesus, amen. Genesis 22, verse one is where it all unfolds. It says, sometime later, sometime later. I like the ESV here. The ESV says, after these things. Like, that's a lot of things. Like after these things from the last 25 years of Abraham walking by faith with the peaks and valleys, sometime later, after these things, God tested Abraham's faith. Now, if you've been following the life of Abraham, you would probably say like me, seems like God's been testing Abraham's faith since day one. (laughs) You know, this is not this is not the first time God has tested Abraham's faith, but but now after all these things, after all that God's done, now we read. Maybe it's like now God really tests Abraham's faith. Now God's going to really, really bring him to the moment of truth. And here's here's what I want you to hear today. And this is not discouraging; it's encouraging. Listen. The more we grow in our faith, the more God will challenge us to grow in our faith. So so the arrival part is is face-to-face with Jesus, right? That's, That's when you've arrived. Until then, wherever you're at in your faith walk, God is gonna challenge you to walk in greater faith. And that's really what he does to Abraham today. So... Uh, often, and this again, I know it can kind of sound discouraging, but it's not. It's the way God works. Often the ultimate test of our faith comes when God calls us to trust him in something that is unbelievable, that is impossible, or that is unbearable, a situation that's unbearable. That's what, that's what it looks like often when God brings us to a point of testing our faith. So it's really good for us that the Holy Spirit lets us know up front that this is a test, like, you know, this is a test of, you know, the emergency faith system. Uh, This is only a test. Uh, It's good because if God didn't tell us up front this was a test, then we might question God a little bit in this story. Uh, But he does tell us right up front, this is a test. It is going to test Abraham's faith in an absolute way, but it is a picture of where God brings you for your ultimate test of faith and mine. So we know it's a test, but Abraham does not know it's a test. Abraham wasn't in on it. So let's read verses one and two together again, and let's see the test. Sometime later, or after these things, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called? Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah, go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> whoa, 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 God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Have you ever, have you ever heard from God and said, oh, what? No, that, that couldn't have been you. Like, <laughs> that wasn't you. What, what are you talking about, God? What exactly do you mean go and sacrifice him? What, what did you just ask me to do? Isaac has been the living proof of the promise of God for at least 15 years. Most people think he's mid-teenager. Some people, maybe it's a bit of a stretch because of all the, all the parallels here, uh, but some people say he might have been 30, even 33, the age of Jesus. But he's not a small child. He's at the very least a teenager. And God says now, take your son, your only son, whom you love so much, and sacrifice him. 
So the Hebrews actually just three commands, bam, 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 staccato commands. They are take, go, sacrifice. The Hebrews really like just imperative uh, right there. God is not messing around. Now listen, you maybe haven't seen a burnt offering. Um, I've, I've never seen a burnt offering, uh, but Abraham had. Abraham knew exactly what a burnt offering was. He knew how to perform one. First, you'd build a, like an altar of wood, and you stack wood heavy around the altar and on the altar, and then you slit the throat of the sacrifice. And then you lay the sacrifice on the altar and light it until it's consumed completely, until there's nothing left of it. That's what Abraham would have understood when he heard this command from God. He would have seen it immediately in his head of taking that knife to his son like he was a lamb. It's not inconceivable to Abraham because human sacrifice was part of the Chaldean pagan culture where he came from. And so it's not like, you know, Abraham would say, oh, that never happens. He'd probably seen human sacrifice. It was in his like world view, like he could imagine it. And so Abraham takes this with the weight of deadly serious. It's a, it's, it is a death or death command. There is no life or death to it. God's calling him to sacrifice his only son. And so suddenly Abraham is now, he thought he was at a crossroads before. Now he's really at a crossroads. Whatever crossroads he thought he was at before, now he's at a greater crossroads. And I don't know if you'd agree, I, I certainly would. This, this would be the greatest crossroads a, a, per, a, a father, a mother or father could ever, could ever get to, especially after you know, what Abraham and Sarah have been through. So the question is, was Abraham willing to trust God? Like, to what level was Abraham willing to trust God? Was Abraham willing to trust God even when it looked like, even when it looked like God was gonna take away his own promise? Was Abraham willing to trust God even when it looked like God himself was going to kill the promise that God himself was going to remove the promise from Abraham's life. How about us? Are we willing to trust God when it looks like God is letting us down? Like, do we have to be constantly, does God have to constantly prove to us are we willing to trust God when it looks like God himself is taking away a promise that he's given us? The key phrase is looks like. This is the thing, it looks like Abraham is gonna lose the promise. It looks like God is going to kill the promise. The promise is gonna die. But it looks that way. The question is, will Abraham trust God? If you know the story, you know the answer, but what about in our own lives? When it looks like God is going to let a promise that he's given us die, do we trust him completely anyway? Do we put our, here's the deal. Do we put our faith in what we see and what we think and what we feel or do we put our faith in who God is and what God has said? See, it's not do you have faith, it's where is your faith? This is what Jesus said to the disciples when he was asleep in the boat and the storm came up and, and the disciples are freaking out and they woke him up and he calms the seas and when he's done he says, where is your faith? Meaning, is your faith in the waves of the ocean or is your faith in me? It's not whether you have faith, it's where it is. And if your faith is in what you think and what you see and how you feel, we call that emotional faith. If your faith is in who God is and what God has said, we call that volitional faith. It's faith of the will. I choose to have faith in God. 
no matter what I see. This is the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. It's like none we could imagine. And it is compared, and, and it's really kind of a parallel teaching, it's so easily compared to God sacrificing his own son fully on the cross. So it's a shocking command to me, after all we've seen Abraham kind of vacillate and, and you know, kind of make his own like faith growth mistakes, it's shocking to me Abraham's obedience. Look at verse three. The next morning, really? You're not gonna like take a week to think about this, Abraham? Like get some confirmation? The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. Guys, Abraham is headed with Isaac to a place called Mount Moriah. And in 2 Chronicles, Mount Moriah is the hill, the, the high place, it's the, we call it, they call it the threshing floor, that King David bought for God to build a temple. And Mount Moriah is the place that Solomon did build the temple. And Mount Moriah is the place where the Temple Mount still stands. And Mount Moriah is actually a ridge, and on the highest place of Mount Moriah is a place that we call Golgotha. Right? Many of you have been there with us. God is having Abraham take his son where God would ultimately take his son. And though Abraham is a test for Abraham, um, God himself would not escape this sacrifice. Verse four. On the third day of their journey, that's interesting, so for three days, Isaac has been as good as dead to Abraham. For three days, Abraham's been walking with his son, realizing that he's a dead man walking. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then, what's the next word? We. And then we will come back. Now, there's one of two choices. Either Abraham's just like, you know, covering, you know, for his servants so that they think, or Abraham believes that we will come back. Generally, everybody believes that Abraham believed. When he said, we will come back, it's actually the pinnacle of Abraham's faith. I mean, this whole event is the pinnacle of his faith, but Abraham did not understand the details. He did not understand the how, but Abraham knew one thing for sure. God's promise would come to pass. Isaac was the son of the promise. And Abraham knew that without a doubt, God would keep his promise, even if it meant raising the promise from the dead. Even if it meant raising Isaac from the dead, God will keep his promise, even if it means raising the promise from the dead. Because you... <laughs> You only think that promise is dead. It's not. God is faithful. He will keep his promise. And so our faith must rest in our unchangeable God. Our faith cannot rest in what we think or see or feel or think we understand or our circumstances. None of that. Our faith has to rest in who our God is and what he has said. Warren Wearsby right here says, Abraham believed God, 
He believed God when he did not know where God was taking him. He believed God when he did not know when the promise would be fulfilled. He believed God when he did not know how the promise would be fulfilled. And so now Abraham believes God when he does not know why God is calling him to sacrifice the promise. Do you get it? See, those little steps of faith always lead to greater steps of faith. And the, the graciousness of God is, is that if we balk at one step, he'll just keep bringing us around to it <laughs> until we make that step. Abraham did believe. We know he did. He believed he was about to sacrifice Isaac, but he had a greater belief that God would keep his promise. And would you and if you would say, well, how can that both those things be true? Abraham would say, I don't know. I don't I don't know. Resurrection wasn't really a common thing uh, in 2000 BC. Um, but Abraham knew even if I have to sacrifice the promise, my son, God will still make good on it. We see it in Hebrews 11. Just write this down in your margin. There at Genesis 22, right? Hebrews 11, 17 to 19. I'll put it on the screen. Hebrews 11, 17 says, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned, verse 19 says, Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead because he considered him dead for those three days. Ooh, there's a lot right there. Abraham believed God. He didn't understand God, but he believed him. And he had reached a point in his faith walk with God where making sense didn't have to be a part of it. It didn't have to make sense. He didn't have to agree. He didn't have to see the end from the beginning. All he had to do was trust and obey. And so now, on the way up Mount Moriah, in the final steps, is just Abraham as the father and Isaac as the son. And they're climbing Mount Moriah together to the place we think, at least in the area, may be the exact place that we call Calvary. And it's just the two of them. Look at Genesis 22, verse six. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife, the tools of judgment, The son carried the wood on his shoulders. The father carried the tools of judgment as the two of them walked on together. That's the parallel teaching. Because Jesus climbed the hill of Calvary with only the father. The scorners and mockers and Romans were there, but it was the father and the son climbing Calvary together. Jesus carrying the wood for the sacrifice, the Father carrying the tools of judgment. So at this point, this ultimate test of Abraham's is getting very, very real. As they walk, we read in Genesis 22, 7 and 8, and I'm gonna put these two verses up in the ESV uh, because the literal is, is important right here. Genesis 22, seven. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. Um, 
but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said in a famous line, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. The Hebrew is literal, you know, uh, well, I, we don't know how to, anyway, it's just the literal is God provide himself a lamb. God provide himself a lamb. Abraham had tremendous faith. God hadn't told Abraham he was gonna provide the lamb. God hadn't let Abraham in on the substitutionary sacrifice. At this point, Abraham believed he was about to sacrifice his own son. But in tremendous faith, he says, God will provide for himself the lamb. Our Kent Hughes says right here, Abraham saying God will provide for himself is at the same time a declaration of trust, an expression of hope, <laughs> and a prophecy of the future. So Abraham's faith is growing every step up Mount Moriah. As he faces his ultimate faith test, every step he takes, his faith grows. Because this is the point. This is the real point. So maybe just reading the text challenges our faith a little, right? You've heard the world say, well, if God was a God of love, you know, why would he do this? Why would he do that? And when someone asks you that, by the way, say, because of sin, because, you know, we live in a fallen world. <sighs> but maybe reading this challenges our own faith as we see ourselves walking up that mountain with Abraham and Isaac, imagining the emotion that's going on. And so the time comes, finally, listen, the time comes where Abraham's faith has to be action. It has to turn into action. And it does in verse nine. Genesis 22, nine says, when they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. A 100-year-old father, 115 or 20-year-old father with his young son, both of them fully trusting God. And, and you have to see, you have to put yourself in Isaac's position a little here. That's pretty faithful on Isaac's part as he's laid on top of the wood. Isaac had to fully cooperate here just as Jesus had to fully cooperate as he crawled up on the cross, as he put himself on the cross. Isaiah 53, seven, right there in your margin there. Isaiah 53, seven says, he was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. That's Jesus, that's Isaac as a picture of Jesus. Maybe, if we want to interject some thoughts, maybe Abraham was telling Isaac about the absolute guarantee of the promise. Maybe during this whole time, Abraham is assuring his son that God would bring him through this moment. He may not have said, even if it means resurrection, but, but he might have even but maybe it was assuring Isaac that God would bring him through, just like the father assured the son that he would bring him through Calvary. Man. What we know for sure is this is faith in action. It's not, it's not I would do it, right? Like that, you know, classic you know, marriage counseling scenario where the husband says, I'd take a bullet for my wife. And the wife says, yeah, but he won't do the dishes. 
uh, you can say you do anything, but your actions speak loud. And so Abraham's actions now have his son, the promise, on the altar. Write down James 2. These are important cross-references. James 2, 21 and 22, write that in your margin. It says, don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions work together. I love this last sentence. His actions made his faith incomplete. So our faith can be faith, but it's incomplete until it turns to action. Right? Ooh, man. So Abraham's faith is going to be made complete by his actions in the next verse. Genesis 22:10. Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. And it's funny here as I've heard other people do this over the years, um, I guess people imagine, you know, like Abraham holding the knife up, right? They've, I've even heard him say that. But they don't do that to a sacrifice. They lay the knife on a neck. And so this is not, you know, I'm going to stab you. This is a sharp blade against the neck of his son. Genesis 22, verse 11. At that moment... Hebrews says is, is, is implying at the very last second, at that very last moment, the angel of the Lord called him from heaven, heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. <laughs> Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And instantly, after 25 years, instantly Abraham passes his ultimate test of faith. <laughs> right? Is that how you feel? Like, you know, I've been in this faith walk a long time, but at some moment, God's going to say, well done. You've passed your ultimate test of faith. And so now the Lord steps in with a substitutionary sacrifice. It's very important in the parallel teaching to recognize that God doesn't say, hey, just kidding, you guys can go back. The sacrifice has to be made. But God provides the sacrifice in the place of Isaac. It's a substitutionary sacrifice. And it's the same thing God would do with his own son 2,000 years later. Genesis 22, verse 13, Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. That became a celebration sacrifice right there. And Abraham and Isaac had passed the ultimate test of their faith. And the Lord had become their provision. Listen, this is so important. The Lord had become their provision. They now knew the Lord in a way that they could not have known him any other way. Look at verse 14. Genesis twenty-two fourteen. 14. Abraham named the place, we would say Yahweh Yerah. But, man, I listened to a guy say this in Hebrew, you know, half a dozen times last night, and I'm like, yeah, I can't say that. Uh, so that's, that's incorrect pronunciation, but it's okay. We call it transliteration. You just say it like it's written. Yahweh Yerah, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And we still cry out to this, the, this name of God. We often say Jehovah Jireh, but actually Yahweh actually comes from Jehovah. Um, but it's a, it's a long process over time. But, but Yahweh is, is the unspeakable name of God. It's, it's the I am. 
and ultimately became Jehovah. So we say Jehovah Jireh now in English, but um, you know the Israelites, the Israelis will laugh at you if you say that. I've had them do it. Um, <laughs> but you know they don't laugh hard because I'm in control of their tip. So they just <laughs> chuckle softly. <laughs> Jehovah Jireh. I think it's one of the most incredible names of God. How many, you know, uh, I use a, a list by um, uh, Henry Blackaby for the names of God, but there's a hundred lists. But I think, I think Henry Blackaby's has almost a hundred. I've seen one with 125. This is one of our favorite, right? Jehovah Jireh. I am Yahweh. I am provide. Or I am provision. God exists as our provision. And through this ultimate test of his faith, Abraham learned like he will never have to learn again that God exists as his provision. And when you face your ultimate test of faith and you pass it, you will never doubt God again because of the intensity of that moment when God asks you to step out and just utter complete faith. And then God provides. That's what changes our relationship with the Lord. Man. So Abraham's response and his passing of the test of faith brings this incredible assurance from God. Verse 15 of Genesis 22. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me, Like obedience is a thing, okay? It's not just repeating a prayer. If we love the Lord, we will obey him. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name. Now that's not, you know, swearing in a bad way. There's nothing else that God could swear by. There's nothing higher. And so he says, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's in Christ. All because you have obeyed me. All because you came to this this crisis moment, this test of faith, and you passed. These are all previous promises here in these verses, but the assurance is God swears by his own name, like, you know, uh, it's a guarantee on top of a guarantee on top of an oath. Um, In the end, listen to this, in the end, the greatest assurance of God's blessing came through Abraham's faithful obedience. The greatest assurance of all of God's blessings came through Abraham's faithful obedience as he faced his ultimate test of faith. Guys, we can count on the promises of God. We can trust who God is, all of his names. He is the great I am, the existing one. And in every area of life, he exists as what we need. And we can count on his promises. They are all yes and amen in Christ. They're guaranteed because of God's character. And they are received by us. The world word is appropriated. They're appropriated to us through our faith that shows in our actions. But God's part is guaranteed. Our job is to grow in our faith when we're tested, not not blame God or question God or criticize God or or run away or, or slip away, but our job is to grow in our faith when we're tested. When you say, man, I think God may be testing my faith, then get on with it, you know? <laughs> like, get on with it. Let him, let him do it. Because, because if you do, he will. He will grow your faith. If you'll, if you'll take that test, he'll grow your faith through that test. Thankfully, 
he probably will not ask us to do what he asked Abraham to do here with Isaac because there's an incredible parallel teaching of Christ here. Uh, but, but even though they will be smaller tests, they will be plenty for us to choose to run away from. And when we do, God will bring us back. And if we run away enough, then our hearts will become hardened towards God. Last verse, Genesis twenty two nineteen. 19. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba where Abraham continued to live. This is where Abraham becomes the father of the faith. I mean, we've been walking with him 25 years as his faith has been growing, but this is the pinnacle. So as we close, let me ask you, do you have an Isaac in your life? Is there a promise, is there a promise that you've received from God that you are afraid might be about to die? Is there a promise that you've received from God that you think that God is not keeping up his end of the bargain, even maybe that God is taking that promise away from you? If so, this is your test of faith. You believe what you feel and the fear and the whatever, or you believe God no matter what you see and no matter what you feel, knowing that God is faithful to bring his promises to pass. Can I ask you today to choose by faith? Choose by faith to set aside what you think and what you feel, even what you see. None of it is real. It's all temporal. It's gonna all go up like a mist in the morning, like a puff of smoke. Set it aside and commit today to put your full and complete faith in God's promises, not because of what you see or think or feel, because who your God is and who he's promised to be. So I wanna give you a chance as we pray to tell God by faith that you will choose to believe his promises to you over what you see and over what you think and over what you feel. You ready? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray, God, that you would speak to us by your spirit. God, some of us have physical Isaacs, sons of the promise to us. But some of us have other types of Isaacs that may be idols in our lives or maybe promises that you've made to us that, that we would question you if things look shaky if it looks like that promise is gonna slip away, if it looks like it's not working out like we thought it would. Lord, we just present that to you right now. We surrender it to you. And by faith, Lord, we say today, we will choose to trust you. We will choose to put our full and complete faith in who you are and what you've said and in every one of your promises, Lord. And we will choose our faith in you above what we see or think or feel, above these current temporal circumstances, Lord. We will put our full and complete faith in you knowing, Lord, that you will bring to pass the promises you've made to us. Let me just be quiet for a second and let you personalize that. If you have the courage, acknowledge to the Lord what that thing is, what that person is, what that situation is that you know that God has promised to you, but it looks like it's slipping away, maybe even dying. Would you just renew your faith today? Faith in God, who he is, what he said, and what he's promised. 
Heavenly Father, we each lay that thing on the altar and we say, Lord, we surrender this to you. And we trust you, Lord, to complete your promise, even if it means raising it from the dead. For your glory, Jesus, and in your name, amen.